to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We are uh, slowly sneaking up on the end of Hebrews. And so uh, we're actually getting into some of the more familiar sections uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are probably uh, some of the more well-known parts of the book simply because we use them so very much. Uh, not only are there several practical uh, admonitions in these sections that preachers tend to find easy to preach on, uh, but uh, th there, there's also such an emphasis upon the sacrifice of Christ and the blood of Christ that we use this material quite a bit. So uh, I, I would encourage you to, to keep this all in context, and I'll talk about that as we get going, uh, just kind of set us all back up. But uh, we are in a bit more familiar territory as we start today. Glad for those of you that are visiting. Good to see everybody here. Uh, John, did, Paul, do you mind leading us in a prayer this morning? Uh, you know, that's an unfair question, isn't it? Because you're not going to say, yes, I mind talking to God. Uh, so, John, would you lead us in a prayer? Thanks. Amen. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, as we kind of come up to our where, where we left off, and, and we didn't meet Wednesday, so it's, it's easy to kind of lose focus. R really, most of Hebrews, uh, beginning all the way back to the end of chapter 2, and then greater emphasis at the end of chapter 4, uh, portrays Jesus in his role as a high priest. And as we've noted repeatedly, that's not an aspect of Jesus' work that we probably pay near enough attention to especially given the fact that our relationship with God is absolutely dependent upon Jesus' work that He's doing now. Not just what He did on the cross, not just what He did uh, in the ascension and the enthronement, but the work that He does all the time for us now, that He ever lives to make intercession. And so from the Hebrew perspective, the idea of Jesus becoming a high priest uh, being Messiah, being Lord, probably what wasn't maybe as difficult for them as the idea that the Hebrew writer is offering now, and that is that you don't have any access to God if you leave uh, the Lord. If you, for whatever reason, uh, desert Jesus as your Lord and, and, and go back and embrace Judaism, if that's what they are contemplating, you don't have a high priest anymore because... As he says at the end of chapter 8, when the priesthood changed, the covenant changed. And you don't live under a Mosaic covenant anymore. And that covenant's not going to do you any good to go back to. Now that's kind of the, the contextual argument that's being made. That, that Jesus is the perfect high priest. Uh, as the priest, the law had to change. If the priesthood changed, the law changed. The law changed, the covenant changed. And that's where he's in the middle of arguing now. And where he's going in this chapter and the next couple is to make the practical implications of this and why this is so vitally important to, the, to these people for whom high priest always associated with Aaron, with the Levites, with the temple or the tabernacle. And now the argument is all of those things were pointing to something greater and that's what you have now. And if you leave it, then you have nothing. You cannot have a relationship with God outside of Jesus Christ, not only as your Savior and Lord, but as your high priest. And so that's kind of where the argument stands as we come to chapter 9, uh, and specifically the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 is now in, in, in effect, and, and here are the implications, which he's about to elaborate on, chapter 9. So, questions or comments before we get into the chapter itself? Anybody? Okay. All right, chapter 9. Let's read through. There's really not a good breaking point here, but uh, let, let's read through uh, old verse uh, 14. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, that will kind of be our goal uh, for the day. 
Then indeed, now remember, uh, at, let's start in verse 13 of chapter 8. In that he says a new covenant, he's made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things had been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone, once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having attained eternal redemption. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Let me start this way. Does that make sense to you? When you, when you just read it, do you understand what he's saying? I, I want you to appreciate this is really not a hard argument. Okay? It, it's not like you read this, if you have any background at all. Now, if you don't have much religious background, I can see where this would be very confusing because it is so rooted in an understanding of the Old Testament worship. For, so for some of you that are not Christians or that are new Christians or that are visitors, yeah, this is, this is hard stuff to chew on. But if you have very much experience, the, this is a fairly easy uh, argument. So, somebody want to summarize it? What does he say in the first 14 verses of chapter 9? Everybody shook your head like, I get it, okay, so prove it. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. We have a better covenant. Okay, we have a better covenant. Keep going. What's the implication? I mean, that's the point he's making. There is a better covenant, and, and here's why. Christ is the sacrifice, and what does that sacrifice do? Huh? It, it cleanses what? It cleanses our conscience. It's not just an external thing that cleanses to the flesh. That, that, that Jesus' priesthood is not where? Where is it not in chapter 9? On earth, in the physical tabernacle. Instead, it is in heaven, in the very presence of God, and His blood provides freedom that you couldn't have under the Old Covenant. That's the substance of the first 14 verses of chapter 9. The difficulty comes in the details. Okay, When you read through this, is there anything about the details that you're kind of fuzzy about? Shake your head yes, because uh, if, if you're not fuzzy about the details, the chances are you're probably not thinking about the details enough. Okay, uh, So I think that's the challenge here is, okay, help me work through the details. So let's look at some of the specific points that he makes. The first several verses, the, the first covenant, which he says is passing away, the old covenant, he said had ordinance of divine service. In other words, there were activities that had to do with worshiping God. That's all that phrase means, okay? Uh, and it says it had an earthly sanctuary, okay? Uh, 
What's he talking about? What's the earthly sanctuary? The tabernacle. Okay, and now he's going to go on and talk about the earthly tabernacle. A tabernacle was prepared. Now, uh, a, a sanctuary is a sacred place, and now he's going to go on and describe why this was a sacred place. Okay, so verse two: a tabernacle was prepared. Uh, let, let's let's be as specific as possible. What's a tabernacle? A tent. Okay, v- very. My, uh, Tori, she loves to go camping. And for her birthday a couple years ago, we, we bought her a tent, okay? We did not give her, we did not bring her a gift and let her open up and she go, hey, a tabernacle. We don't, <laughs> we don't interchange those concepts. When we think tabernacle, we think the place in the old law where God was worshipped. But it's just a tent. So get that in your head. And that's the point he's making. A tent was prepared, and and it was divided. The first part, he says, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, or uh, probably, literally, this would read the holies, or the holy place. Okay, And, and if you have marginal notes in your Bible, you probably see the reference there that literally the word is not sanctuary, but it's holies. And the description of it is that there was a lampstand, a table, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, a lampstand and table in it. Okay, and that's what's in the first part of the tent. Everybody kind of familiar with what the tabernacle was, how the tabernacle was designed? Yes? If you're not, I really need you to, to shake your head no, because uh, I, I need to know how much to elaborate and how much to move on. Anybody? Okay, so you have this tent that's divided. The first part had a couple of of, uh, articles in it. It had a table. And on this table was placed 12 loaves of bread every week. And on the Sabbath day, that bread was taken up and eaten by the priests, and it was replaced by new bread. And and it was an offering to God, okay? And then there was a lampstand. It was golden. Uh, It was made of one piece. Uh, most people have a concept of this, the menorah, and it was shaped somewhat like a tree uh, with, with arms that came out like this and lamps on the end. It was all made of solid gold and it was kept burning all night, every night. They, they put it out in the morning during the day, but it was kept burning continually at night. And so his argument is if you went into the first part of the tabernacle, that's what you would see. There is also another article in the first part of the tabernacle that's actually not mentioned here. Anybody know what that was? Huh? I heard somebody going, that's what I heard. Huh? No, hang on, hang on. Aaron's rod is what you're thinking, but that's going to be in the next part. Anybody know what else was in the first part? Come on. Nobody? Say it. The altar of incense was also in there, which was, uh, uh, you know, a a kind of a a probably three foot, four foot high uh, square, I I don't know, pillar uh, that was made out of gold that uh, had a, a place on the top that you put incense to burn. And it would have stood right at the edge of where the, the, the curtain was that divided the holy place from the most holy place. So get the picture in your head. You've got a, you've got a tent that's, I'm trying to remember how long it was, 90 feet, does that sound right? And 60 feet was the front room, and, and that's what he describes here. You go into the first part, you've got the lampstand and the showbread, and that's called the holy place. Verse 3, behind the second veil. Now, the argument of that is there was a curtain, actually a kind of a, uh, what, what, what do you call a movable, a movable shield? It uh, wasn't a curtain that hung from the top. It, it was something on stands. Anybody? Huh? A petition, yeah, something like that, that, that you could move. Uh, and, and, and it sat in the very front, Okay. Uh, but then between the first room and the second room was a curtain that hung, okay? 
And, and, and so now, verse 3, behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, or we probably are more familiar with the term the holy of holies, or the most holy place which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we can't speak in detail. It's kind of an interesting description here because the first thing he mentions being in the most holy place is what? What's the first thing he says is in there? Huh? Well, he doesn't say altar of incense, does he? Yours does? You need to quit reading this heretical translations. Okay? Because the word is not altar of incense, actually. Anybody else? How does it read in the New King James? Censor. And that's what the word is. It, it's really not... Is it in italics? Is altar of incense in italics? It's a heretical ancient translation that they've taken it from. Uh, this, this reads censer, and censer was a fire pan that they would use to carry incense that was being burned. I think it's interesting that that's the word that you find in, in most of the translations. Uh, and, and so some people would make this observation. When Aaron went into the most holy place at the Day of Atonement, he had to burn incense, and that incense was intended to fill up the most holy place. And the way I've got this in my mind, and this is just my mind, but I do think it had to have had been something like this. When you burn incense, what does incense produce? Smoke. And so when he went into the most holy place, which is a fairly small room, it would be filling with smoke, which even, I think, is a significant event that's taking place. Now the, the question is, and it's very clear in the Old Testament that the altar of incense is inside the holy place. How is it that the smoke got from the holy place into the most holy place on the other side of a curtain? That, that's why I think this is probably mentioned the way that it is. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament that there was ever a censer, but there had to be a way to get that in, burning incense into the most holy place. It's possible that the altar of incense was set right at the edge and you pulled the curtain back. Okay, that, that's a very real possibility. And many people, many scholars made the argument from verse 4 that the golden censer is the altar of incense. And that's the translation that you see in RSV, uh, uh, ESV, ASV, NASV. Uh, and, and so there's some question here. But the, the argument or, or the, the, the issue is, again, how do you burn incense in one room and it ends up in the other room? Um, and, and there is the possibility that they carried, that Aaron carried the burning incense into the other room with a golden censer. Okay? There's a lot about the tabernacle stuff, folks, that we don't have details about. Okay? But just understand that's what that's referring to. The way that they carried... The incense, the burning incense, or the way that it became a part of the most holy place, it was connected to that worship, even though it was also connected to the regular sacrifices. Okay? Uh, and then the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, anybody ever see Raiders of the Lost Ark? Raise your hand. Okay? You saw the picture that, you know, when Indiana Jones and, and Sala pick up the Ark and. and that's a pretty good representation as far as what I can tell of what the ark probably looked like. Size and everything. It was a chest oh, about, this, about this long. The, the lid was solid with a, a trim around it with two cherubim, which I think are probably angelic type beings. And they are facing each other, looking down. Uh, and, and that's what's being described here. It, it really is actually, I think, a, probably a pretty good representation. Okay? Uh, and that was inside the most holy place. And inside the, the chest were what? Now, now uh, uh, Charles, what was inside the chest? Aaron's rod. Uh, remember when uh, Aaron's leadership as priest was questioned in the book of Numbers and they brought uh, everybody, uh, the leader of each tribe brought the rod out, left it overnight in the tabernacle, came back the next morning. Aaron's rod had budded God. Uh, confirmed him as being the priest. That was in there. What else was in there? 
uh, a golden bowl full of manna. And, and by the way, the Old Testament never says anything about a golden bowl. But uh, that doesn't mean that it wasn't the case. There are a number of times where we learn things about Old Testament details from the New Testament. And I'm going to mention this in the sermon this morning. The only way we know that Saul reigned for 40 years is because of uh, Paul's sermon in Acts chapter 14. Okay, so, you, you know, sometimes we get some details from later inspiration. So there's a golden bowl in there with manna in it. And then the other thing that was in there was what? The Ten Commandments. Okay, the tablets, uh, Moses broke the first ones, but God, uh, Moses chiseled the next ones, God wrote on them, and they were kept in there. Notice at the end of verse 5, he says, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Why not? Huh? They haven't seen them. Okay, whoever's writing Hebrews never saw that stuff. In fact, who saw what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Just the people that put it in there. Because it was never to be opened. Okay? And, and so, in one way he's saying, we can't speak about these things in detail because we've never seen them. What else is true about the Ark of the Covenant? When the Hebrew writer is writing this, where was the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> Who knows where it was? You know, uh, buried in an antechamber somewhere in Egypt for Indiana Jones to find 2,000 years later, okay? Nobody knows what happened to the ark. It's not mentioned in the Old Testament really after Josiah's rule. So after the Babylonian captivity begins, we never know anything about the ark anymore. Was it brought back? Possibly. But you have to remember the temple was ransacked again by the, the, uh, the, the Greeks uh, under Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, so we really don't know what happened to the ark. And, and I'm inclined to think that when he says at verse 5, of these things we cannot now speak in detail, it's because nobody really knows what happened to this stuff. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. What's the main argument he's making here about the Old Covenant? It's passed away or it's passing away. And he says, you know, there was a sanctuary, there was a place of worship where you worshipped God, and we know what was in there, we know what was in the first room, and we know what was in the second room, but none of that stuff's there anymore. We don't even know for sure what happened to it. Can you draw any conclusion from that? It's all physical. It, yeah, it's, it's passed away. It's gone. Surely if this was the end-all, be-all of worshiping God, God would have made sure it stayed there. And if you don't believe that, go back to 1 Samuel in the first couple of chapters when before they have a king and they're in a war with the Philistines and they're losing, what do they do? What do the children of Israel do? Eli is the high priest in Shiloh. They'll go get the ark, and they bring it in. And what happens? The Philistines take it because they win the battle. And what, ha what does God do then? <laughs> he plagues the Philistines so bad that they finally stuck it on an ox cart and sent it home. Now, and here's the point of that. If the Ark of the Covenant and the Old Testament tabernacle was the end-all, be-all of worship to God, God had already proved that if somebody took it, He'd make sure it came back. But it's not back now. And I want you to appreciate, I think that's a powerful part of this argument that's almost unstated and implied. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so, of these things we cannot now speak in detail. All right, so here's the physical construction. Now, look, now verse 6. Let's talk about the service. When these things have been prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. Every day, all the sacrifices that took place, the priests were in and out of that first room. And they were in and out of that first room because any blood sacrifice, especially sin offerings and burn offerings, they had to take some of the blood and they had to put it on the corners of the tabernacle of, of the altar of incense. That's why we know it was in the first place, the first room. And they had to put it on the four corners. And then they had to sprinkle some of the blood where? 
on the curtain, on the veil. We know that from the first uh, four, five, eight chapters of Leviticus. Okay? So every day, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the service. They had to light the candles every morning. They had to put uh, every night, evening. They had to put the candles out every morning. Uh, they had to change the showbread. They were in and out of that first part all the time. Okay, and I, and and by the way, let me let me get you to think this through in practical terms. If you're offering a sacrifice, you you are standing beside the altar, putting your hands on the head of the animal and killing the animal yourself. That was your part as an offerer. Okay, then the priest, the first thing he would do is start making the sacrifice and he would pour the blood out and he would take some of the blood and he would go into the first place. Okay, if it was a curtain, even if it was a hanging partition that he had to pull back, when he went in as an offerer, what could you see? You could look into the first part, couldn't you? I mean, just common sense says if it was a curtain that you could actually, when that curtain was put, you could, you could get a glimpse of what was in there. You see that curtain in there, you might catch a glimpse at the table. The, the table and the lampstand would have been off to the side. Okay? But, but depending on your angle, my suspicion is most Israelites had, had been able to see at least a little bit of what was inside the holy place. That makes sense to you? Yes? Okay. Uh, so, the, the, into the first part, the, the priests always went performing the services. But verse 7, into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people since committed in ignorance. The, the, the day of atonement, the high priest would actually go into the most holy place, I think, three times. Okay? What he would do is he would offer a bull for himself. And he would have to go into the holy place just like any other sacrifice. But he also then would take some of that blood into the most holy place and sprinkle it, uh, I think, on the ark. Okay? It just says before the Lord. Then he would come back out and offer a goat. Now this was for the sins of the people. And it was once again a sin offering. So he did the very same thing. The difference being, he would go back into the most holy place again, one more time, and, and offer blood for the sacrifice of the people. Uh, it seems to me, and I'd have to go back, and I didn't go back and read the service, but it seems to me he goes back in a third time, but I may be mistaken. But he never goes in there without blood for something. And that's the point that's made. Into the second part, the high priest went alone. Nobody could go with him. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the sins uh, uh, committed in ignorance. Okay, so did anybody ever, other than the high priest, see into the most holy place? No. Okay? And, and you can make this argument, even when they were taking it down, way back during the, the wilderness wanderings, which that always occurs to me, because uh, if you're doing the daily Bible reading, just this week we read about the Levites moving stuff. Even if they took it down, the priests would first go in, cover up all of the furniture and the ark and the incense and everything. It was all covered up before the Levites ever came in and started taking all the tent down in order to move it. So nobody ever saw this stuff, ever. Only the high priest. He only went into that place once a year. Now, what did the ark and the cherubim represent? You'll notice uh, in verse uh, 5, the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. What did that represent? It, it represented the throne. Actually, it represented the footstool. At three or four different times, David describes the 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 Ark of the Covenant as the footstool of God, that God's throne was an unseen throne above. And that's why it says that God appeared above the cherubim and that God spoke from over the cherubim. The, the, the lid itself is not the throne of God. It's the footstool of God, and God's throne is an unseen thing up above. So when the high priest went into the most holy place, he was going into the throne room of God. That makes sense. 
Okay, so this is the description. And I don't mean to pound that into your head if you already know that. But you need to get this picture. This is the picture he's painting for these Christians. Okay? Look at verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this. Now just stop right there. What's the work of the Holy Spirit in Scripture? And I don't want theories. I don't want emotionalism. I want to know what the Bible says the Holy Spirit has done in God's work. Revealed God's will. Okay? Whether it's speaking through the prophets in the Old Testament, uh, speaking through the prophets and apostles in the New Testament, that's the only thing that God tells us for certain that the Holy Spirit does. Okay? And please remember that if you get caught up in some of the stuff that's being taught and promoted in this day and age about the Holy Spirit and all the stuff He does. There is one solid ground you can stand on about what the Holy Spirit has done for mankind, and that is to reveal the will of God. Okay? So, notice verse 8 says the Holy Spirit is teaching something here, indicating something. What word is used there in the, in the uh, using ESV? Uh, does it say indicating? The old King James says signifying, indicating. In other words, God the Spirit is using the tabernacle and its design and its service to teach something, to reveal something. This is interesting to me because it's not a revelation by word, but it is nonetheless a revelation by system and picture and metaphor. Does that make sense to you? So the Holy Spirit is using all of this tabernacle and designed it, God designed it for this purpose, to indicate that the way into the holiest of all is not manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. Uh, in other words, this was God's teaching man all along that, that you don't have a way to God yet. Okay? And everything about the tabernacle really taught this one thing. You couldn't come before God. The only person that ever got anywhere close to God, if you want to look at it in physical terms, was who? In the Old Testament system. Moses is a kind of an exception to the rule. Okay? Under the Old Covenant, and that's what's being discussed here. Okay? Only the high priest ever got close to God. And when he went into that room, now we're coming back to a point I made a while ago. When he went into that room, what was that room full of? Smoke. Okay? I've always thought it was interesting when you read about the high priest's garments. Anybody remember what was at the bottom of the high priest's garments? Bells. Bells and pomegranates. So every time he walked in there, People knew he was in there moving around, but what that, what that, kind of what I've always gathered from that is, it might have been pretty hard to see in there. And the, the idea is God knows you're in there because he can hear the bells moving around. That's the picture that's painted. But what I want you to see is all, the, all this system God used as a picture. What was the picture? It was intended to underscore that you can't get close to God. You know, we think of it the other way around. It was intended to be a way to, to get close to God, and it was, but for the person offering the sacrifice, when the priest went into the most holy place, what could they see? Huh? They could see into the most holy place. What could they not see? They couldn't see in there where God was supposed to be, right? You get that? And the smoke, what did that teach? It, it said even the high priest, when he went in once a year, only under certain conditions... It was still... It's not like you're walking in there and gazing upon the face of God. And there's an interesting statement in verse 8. Notice the end that says, All this was not yet made manifest... All was not made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. That word tabernacle uh, can, can be understood in two different ways that he's either saying as long as the whole tabernacle was constructed, the Holy Spirit was trying to say, you can't get to God yet. But there's a more interesting possibility because he says the first. 
And, and the first already in the context is the first room of the tabernacle. And, and, and so it may be that what he's saying is as long as that tabernacle was built the way that it was, and there was a first room and a second room, as long as there was always that first room there, you were never going to get to God. Okay? And I find that really interesting. Because the argument that he's going to go on to make is, if you go back to that, you won't ever get to God. And the point he's already made is, where is Jesus? He's, 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 he's right there with God, and what is He doing for you? He's already made this point. What is He doing for you? He's interceding for you. You have, as Andy pointed out loud, you have the right and the privilege and the access to go be in the very presence of God. And as long as that first tabernacle was standing, you could never do that. Okay? That is powerful. It doesn't mean as much to us. Because we've always, we've just grown up with this concept that I can go into the presence of God. But I'll tell you what studying this does for us. It ought to tell us what a blessing it is. And when you study the Old Testament and the way God designed things that for centuries man had no access to God, now we have intimate access with God. Man, how does that not impact you and move you and cause you to think and appreciate and, and, and thank and praise God that we have that when people forever didn't have it? Uh, Andrew? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And 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 I mean, you can take this and 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 make all kinds of applications. I mean, you could go back and make this application. After Solomon built the temple, there was never a tabernacle again. Why is he going back and talking about the tabernacle and not the temple? And if you couldn't hear Andrew, you remember. At the crucifixion of Jesus, the veil of the tabernacle was torn from top to bottom. And notice that it's noted that way. Men could grab it at the bottom potentially and tear it, but nobody could get up to the top and tear it from top down. So there's all kinds of, of applications about the temple and the tabernacle and the design. But why does he go back and talk about the tabernacle here and not the temple? Because the temple unless this was written after A.D. 70, the temple was still standing. Anybody? What's the tabernacle particularly connected to in the Old Testament? When did, when did God give the instructions for it? At the same time, He did what? Gave the law and made a covenant. So He's going back, I think, to the tabernacle because His argument is the covenant changed. The priesthood changed. The law changed. Even the tabernacle, which eventually would become the temple, was designed in such a way as to teach you that this was not God's permanent arrangement. God never designed this to be the end. And that's why he says the Holy Spirit signified in the way it was designed that the way to God was not, was not made known yet. So, verse 9, it was symbolic. Okay? And, and you run into this a lot in these, in these chapters of Hebrews. You're going to use the word symbolic or image or type or example or shadow. Uh, we talked about shadow a little bit last Sunday. All of these are the same concepts that have to do with reality versus what you can see that's not real. So it was symbolic for the present time. For those people living now in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. This raises a question in my mind that I think is really pretty interesting. If you did everything that the old law told you to do, what could you expect that God would do relative to your sins? The, the obvious answer is the answer I'm looking for. Say it out loud. Forgive them. He says it very clearly in the first four chapters of Leviticus. You offer the burnt offering, you offer the sin offering, 
God will make atonement, and your sins will be forgiven. Okay? Now we understand that that forgiveness was based upon the fact that the perfect sacrifice is coming. But what they understood was, I was forgiven. I am forgiven when I walk away from here. And, and yet, the point is made repeatedly. They made these, these gifts and offerings in the tabernacle, and it never made them perfect relative to conscience, which, which kind of leads me to this thinking. Do, do you suspect that anybody ever walked away from making a sacrifice for sin and thought, I still feel guilty. There's something's, something's not quite right here. Now this is purely a speculative. I get that. But have you ever thought about that? Because he makes this argument a couple of times here that, that their conscience wasn't clean. And even the writer, if he was a Jew before he became a Christian, would have gone through this process. And, and here's... Here's kind of my thinking out loud about why he says that. I sinned. I have have done injustice before God. I have broken His law. I have done everything He asked me to do out of faith. And He has told me that I am forgiven. But that animal is just an animal. The animal didn't do anything. He's innocent. I'm guilty. I get that but it's, it's just an animal. There, there's no equal value here. D- do you think that they ever walked away going, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. We, we put a lot of emphasis on emotion in this day and age, and I find this kind of an interesting consideration. Because if you've, if you've done something wrong, Conscience is a hard taskmaster. And guilt can eat you alive. And I think we deal with it already even with the sacrifice of Christ. We know we're forgiven. It still bothers us sometimes what we've done. But I don't ever doubt my forgiveness. What I doubt is my worthiness, my my ability to go forward and not do this ever again. But I wonder if they doubted their forgiveness. I'll tell you something else to think about that came from our Bible reading last week. On the great day of atonement, when the high priest went into the most holy place, offered the bull, offered the goat, what did he come out at the very end and do? He he, he took another goat. He put his hands on the goat. He confessed all the sins of Israel on the goat. And then what happened to that goat? Somebody took it out in the wilderness and let it go. And, and I look at that and go, what does that mean? I thought, I thought our sins were forgiven. Why are they still out there wandering around? And, and I tell you, the whole system, while it was intended to offer a relationship with God at the same time, for I just think for a conscientious man, it was unsatisfying. And I think that's the argument here. It never made them perfect in regard to the conscience. It, notice it doesn't say it never made them perfect in regard to their standing before God. It, it never made them perfect in regard to their own understanding and appreciation of their innocence. Because, verse 10, it's concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings. By the way, that's the same word back in chapter 6, translated baptisms. Remember we talked about that? Uh, and fleshly ordinances imposed till the time of reformation. When God was going to make everything right, all these things were going to be done away with, but the Holy Spirit designed all this physical stuff, not just to teach you that you can be forgiven, but to teach you that not really. (laughs) Does that make sense? Now, is that genius? Is that divine right there? I heard people talk about, well, you know, the Bible's just a construction of fables and fairies. Nobody comes up with this stuff. Okay? And so verse 11, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, relative to the old stuff, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this creation. Okay, we're talking about where now? Heaven. Let, let Let me stop right here. I don't know that there is a literal 
temple-like, tent-like throne of God in heaven. That when we get there, that we're going to find a tabernacle that God dwells in the most holy place. I, I do think you need to consider that once we get to the spiritual realm, we're using these physical pictures to understand what's happening there, not necessarily a literal picture. Maybe, but may not be. So if you get, when you get to heaven and you go in looking for the tabernacle, don't be disappointed if it's not there. Okay, His point is that Jesus is before God in a place that wasn't made with hands, and He didn't come before God with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but with His own blood, and He entered into the most holy place to obtain eternal redemption. And we'll pick up with that thought right there Wednesday night. Okay, A lot to process here, a lot of picture to get in your head, but very, very powerful. Okay, Thank you.